Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Pedro Alves. He's the CEO of a Silicon Valley startup called Opal. They deal with artificial intelligence and data mining. And the way Pedro puts it is he wants to make AI easy, cheap, and ubiquitous. Welcome to the show, Pedro. Thank you. How did you get Opal started? Because you worked in a bunch of companies, and they're very interesting companies. Mm -hmm. One is Banjo. Right which was, and you were the chief data science officer there. Right. And then you worked for Sentient. Mm -hmm. And the founders of Sentient also contributed towards Siri. Right. Because you deal with AI, and AI in some ways is about decision making and this is the branching, you know, how you come to a decision. Yeah. That's why I was asking you that question. What is it that you learned at Banjo? What is it that you learned at Sentient? And what is it that you're bringing to Opal that you started in 2017? Mm -hmm. Why did you want to start a company? So. First, my first job in industry, I was already, you know, doing this. I was, I was a data scientist. I was, I was building models. I was handling data, and I saw where I was needed, and I saw where a company had about fifteen thousand employees, and I saw the necessity for a person like me. But at the same time, I, I thought, a lot of the places that I was spending my time in, I thought they're. They're overpaying me. Like the the <laughs> that's a nice problem to have. Not not always actually. No, you don't want to be overpaid. It's not a pretty day when they realize that they're overpaying. But I don't mean in general for the position. I mean for some of those tasks. And I thought a machine needs to take over these tasks. Uh, you know, a person that went goes through the training that I've been or other data scientists have been. They need to spend their time and their, their brain power in other places that's more valuable. And so I immediately started thinking, okay, how do you automate and make this job easier? Because you know, it, it, it's the equivalent of requiring a jet engine engineer to fly a plane. Mm. It's a waste, right? You'd be overpaying him. Uh, you want him building new engines and developing new technologies. You don't want them applying the technologies he invented. But then you have to create models where he can test that engine. Yes, and, and it's two completely separate um, positions, right? A pilot and a, a person that invents and designs engines. Um, they're both needed, but when you have just the same person having to do both, the industry gets blocked by that. And that's uh, one of the blockages or limiting factors of AI today is that's the state of things today, I believe. Okay. So that's how you got the idea to start your company, uh, Opal. Yes. I, I've been thinking about it for, for many, many years about how do you like you said, you know, turn AI into something that's easy, cheap, and ubiquitous. How is that? I transition? didn't say that's what you. Well, know. yes, yes, you quoted me in the beginning. Now I'm quoting you, quoting me. Yes. Yeah. So you're very good at learning to learn because that's what your company does. It is learning to learn to learn. Okay. Meta learning. <laughs> right. So this is meta meta learning. Oh, it's meta meta learning. Okay. Yeah. Explain to us what it is. So you have an algorithm, a uh, machine learning model, right? And uh, if you want, I can explain a little more what like a deep learning a neural network is and I don't know if I need to go there. Yeah, you can. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people talk about neural networks and it's actually really simple to, to explain. Um, imagine that you have this neural network, which is just neurons connected, right? But it is mimicking your brain, the neural um, network. I don't believe it's mimicking the brain. I think our understanding of the brain today is like our understanding of the universe a thousand years ago. I think we're not, can't even understand the brain right now. Okay. So I don't like that analogy, but it's a network of connected neurons, if you will. But imagine I was trying to teach a neural network to decide, is this a picture of a rhino or an elephant? And you have a, a row of people right here, five people next to each other. And I tell you, look, when you see a picture of a ear that has a ear of an elephant, you raise your hand. And this person, when they see a, a trunk of an elephant, and this person, when they see the, the horn of a, a rhino. And then the row behind, I say to a person, you, when you see the ear and the trunk of an elephant, you raise your hand because you're the head of the elephant, and so forth and so forth. And then the behind them. So there's clustering. Uh, it's not clustering. It's you're you're learning in layers. The first layer learns simple, smaller things. The next one layer uh, learns from the previous. And then the last layer, I'll tell the person, if you see the person that raises their hand for the head of an elephant and the body of an elef elephant, you raise your hand for elephant. So. The first row is the only row looking at the picture. The second row is just looking at the people in the first row, and the third row looking at the second row. And how the algorithm learns is, at first I'll tell you, raise your hand when you see the ear of an elephant, but you've never seen the ear of, ele of an elephant, and I'm not telling you what it looks like. So you're gonna randomly raise your hand. So I show you a picture, you literally randomly raise your hand, and then it causes a chain reaction of them raising their hand and them raising their hand. And at the very end, if the person that raised their hand is an elephant, 
and the picture was an elephant, I give that person a piece of candy and I say, good job, you, you were right. And he tells the next row, hey, good job, here's some of the candy. And he tells and you, good job. And if it wasn't, I'll slap his hand and say, nope, that was a rhino. And then he'll slap their hands and she'll slap your hand. And that's how they learn. And that's basically how neural networks, the algorithm works and how you teach it. You keep showing pictures. They'll keep randomly doing things until you, you incentivize them positively or negatively, and then they learn. Um, so that's learning. And the, going back so to is the question. The repetition, pattern recognition, all of that come into play there. Yes, and there's a lot of math into how that candy being given or the slap in the hand happens. That's actually mathematically done, but basically that's it. And we were talking about learning to learn to learn. That's level one of learning. That is, you show a bunch of pictures, you slap some hands, and the algorithm learns, right? Done. Now, maybe it only got to 90% accuracy telling the difference between a rhino and an elephant. And we're like, you know what? That's not good enough. Maybe we need to add more people. Maybe a person for a feet of an elephant. We didn't have that. So you add more people, more neurons. Um, that's called parameters mm. of the, this network. And there's infinite set of parameters you could choose from. You could have many, many layers, not just three, 10, 50, 100. So how do you know which parameters to choose? So the learning to learn, the second learning, is a learning on how these algorithms are learning. So uh, a person, I can watch you learn and say, yeah, you got 90%. I had a, another person, it got to 91%. I had another person, 92 So I'm like, okay, every time I had a person, it seems to get a little better. So I'm learning how you're learning. So then I'll choose the parameters based on that until I find a nice set of parameters that works really well. Up till recently, people used to do that. Data scientists would run 10 algorithms overnight, come back the next morning, see how they did, choose the next set of parameters. So learning to learn is when you automate that, you have a machine that watches how the algorithms learn, and it learns to choose the parameters. That's what it's choosing. So that's why it's called learning to learn, because it's learning how the algorithm is learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when I, I saw that, I... I was excited about it because it was... Where did you see it? In a paper. There's a paper from Google called Learning to Learn. I believe it's probably about three years old now. Maybe a little old. Yeah, right around there. And I saw that and I thought, awesome. That's a little bit of what I was thinking of, automating what I have been doing manually, right? But when I looked at it, my first thought was, that's not exactly what I'm doing because uh, given this Learning to Learn framework, it is within a project. So the elephant versus rhino project. The algorithm's gonna learn, the machine's gonna learn how it learns and choose the, uh, the parameters. When you do a new project, it starts from scratch. It's gonna start learning to learn again. And I thought, well, if that's mimicking what I was doing, how come every time I did a new project in a new industry, a new field, I was better at it and I was faster at it. I was growing as a data scientist. So if I was getting better at learning to learn, that means that I was learning to learn to learn, right? So if I was learning to learn to learn, I can teach a machine to learn to learn to learn. And that's what that third learning is. It's something that carries over from project to project. And it, there's something that is generalizable enough that allows you to get better at this whole process. And that's what I was trying to, to get at with um, one of the technologies behind Opal. So what you explained was, you said scientists set up models and then they may set up 10 experiments or models. They'll come the next day and see what it is. Yeah. And you talked about parameters. So those would be variables, independent and dependent variables, how they interact. I'm just trying to understand from a layperson's perspective. So what you're doing is you're tweaking those variables to see which parameter works. Did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now that <clears throat> you've, uh, you've learned this, uh, how do you know if you've got the right information? Because the data has to be good. Do you have the right data? Do you have good data? Aren't those questions that you should be asking when you teach a machine to learn? Yes. Um, I don't think data is ever going to be perfect or, or clean, like perfectly clean. Or, or, or correct. Um, or correct. There's going to be mistakes in the data uh, from a lot of... Uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, some of them are how it's stored uh, and the software itself might be buggy. Some of it is human uh, caused uh, mistakes in the data. But I think it's, it's um, unreasonable to expect that a piece of software only can, can only work with perfect data because no data scientist will ever get get a perfect piece of data. So I believe the, the expectation for the software should be the same as the expectation for hiring great data scientists, which is the data is not going to be great. 
I, I think I was being the devil's advocate because uh, when, you, when you're handling the data, sometimes you can make out where, why your results are not coming out right. You may do stepwise regression, you may do other things and see what works. But if the data itself is flawed in some ways, and if you don't catch it in mm -hmm. the first iteration, that's okay. where I'm coming from. Okay, so, so there's a couple of things there. Um, one of them is... Uh, this question of how do you know that this model that was built on this data is really working? Because just telling me an accuracy doesn't necessarily mean it's working. You want to know that when new data comes along, it's not going to make some crazy decision, right? Um, if it's a piece of model that is going to determine how much, how many milligrams of a drug to give a patient, you want to make sure that it didn't learn that if the person is wearing polka dotted shoes, that it should give more drug, more of the drug, because clearly that's wrong, right? So uh, there's a there's a paper that came out also a few years old, but it was very interesting. It highlights that. There's this data set called ImageNet, and it's for detecting objects within images. It's uh, computer vision, and it's a thousand different types of objects. And the, some model was perfectly capable of determining the difference between a Siberian Husky and a wolf. They are very similar looking mm. animals. And they said, okay, let's understand why. Let's dig into the model and understand why the model and how the model could tell the difference between the husky and the wolf. And they saw that it wasn't looking at the animal to make that distinction at all. It was looking at the background. If the background was snow, it was a husky. If it was woods, it was a wolf. Because the entire data set consisted of these, these animals in those environments. That's an outlier. <laughs> right. So what happens when that animal is in a vet clinic table being operated on? It will have no idea if it's a wolf or a, or a, a, a Siberian husky. It doesn't even understand. It wasn't looking at the animal at all for, for telling the difference. So that's a problem. And you can never... So one way of tackling that problem is if you say, you know what? I've already trained this model with every picture ever taken in history and every picture that will ever be taken. So even though it might be overfitting, it doesn't matter because the model is only going to execute on the pictures it's seen, period. That is never the case, right? So you can't do that. What can you do is through what's called model transparency or model, um, model explainability is what that paper was hinting at is you need to understand why the model is making the decisions it's making so that you can feel comfortable that even though it hasn't seen every possible picture and variation of a husky, if you see that, ah, look, there's these minute differences in the corner of the eye or the nose, then you'll feel more comfortable that when it sees a crazy new picture in a new environment, you know, that it'll know because you believe that the how and why it's operating is, is correct. It learned the real thing. Mm. So what your company does is B2B then. Your, your customers are businesses or yes. enterprises. Yes. Right? So you founded it in 2017? Correct. And you've already raised 10 million? Yes. Okay. You raised 8 million in 2018 and you said after raising money, you had a little celebration and you went home and you were stressed out. Yes. Because usually people are very happy when they raise yes. money, you know? Yes. You should have had a Kaiperenia. <laughs> <laughs> but why were you stressed? So we raised on a Friday. We went out for lunch, uh, celebrated with the company. It was great. I came home. I, uh, the, the whole ecstatic feeling had already died off by the time I came home Friday. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, my wife kept asking me, you look really depressed. What's wrong? You seem depressed. And I kept trying to think, am I depressed? I don't feel depressed, but something is off and it's making her, you know, she can read me really well. So I trusted her reading. And then on, on, by the end of the day, Sunday, I realized what it was. I wasn't, I wasn't um, depressed. I was confused and worried that I didn't know what to be worried about. Right, because I had been worried about raising money, and you know that's always a big worry, and it was in my mind for so many months that I felt relief, but then that triggered a response of worry because the relief meant I wasn't worried, and I knew I should be worried about a lot of things. We're a startup, so first thing I did immediately Sunday night, and then Monday morning was put a list of here are all the things I need to be worried about now because it's going to be even harder than before getting this eight million dollars, and uh, you know that was it. And once I did that then I was back to being worried, but worried about the right things, not just worried that I wasn't worried about anything. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, uh, and then your venture capitalist, one of your uh, VC uh, yes. guys showed up. Yes, that same week he showed up and we had a nice first talk of, I just invested this money, these are the things I expect, this is the onboarding. Fantastic conversation, we're very open to each other. Um, but he, he went through that process of, you know, a lot of CEOs get too excited and they'll spend months in this like, 
basking in, in the cloud <laughs> and then, you know in heaven and <laughs> and I want to make sure that you're not doing that that you look if you want to raise B and you start backtracking all the targets that you need to hit you should have started four months ago to raise B so you're already four months behind and I, and I told them we're on the same page on Monday I was already <laughs> there so but thank you for bringing that up but I'm glad that we're thinking very alike so are you already worrying about your next uh, round of funding always always okay before we go any further, what is what what is your definition of a data scientist? I mean, that's such a hot new skill set. Wherever you turn, people yes. want to become a data scientist. Yes, uh, it is a very exciting field. Are you a data scientist? I, I believe so. Yes. Okay. So, what's a data scientist? It's I mean, it's this amalgam right now of being a mathematician, statistician, machine learning scientist, software engineer, good communicator, and too big, business. too big. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even. Yeah, it, I had to take a big breath to even say it. <laughs> That's a unicorn. <laughs> yes, and, and I believe that's one of the biggest problems. Um, you know, the early days of aviation had the Wright brothers. Yes. Building the planes and flying the planes. They were the pilots. You can't build United Airlines when it requires you to train and hire a million Wright brothers. You can't have a million Wright brothers. I think, you know, obviously the fuel of aviation advanced to a point that the requirements for becoming a pilot got lowered and more reasonable, and then you can start mass producing pilots or, you know, different types of, of uh, professionals. I think that's where we are with today with AI, data science, et cetera. It's that transition. It's still, the requirements are still too high and unreasonable. There's people that can do that, but it's never going to be in the masses. And, you know, you're promising AI to be the new electricity. Well, if it's new electricity, it must be able to touch everyone and touch every company. And it'll never do that when there's a small select few that can do it really well, right? So it's not a utility still? It's not, not there yet, but okay. that's... Okay. So my next question is Elon Musk. He has lots to talk about AI, and he's a little worried. He he talks about what AI, especially what you're doing, you know, learning uh, to uh, learning to learn, the, the machines are learning to learn. Right. He's a little worried that we don't understand how these machines learn and how they think. Yes. What is your response to that? So... Should we be worried? Um, sure. Why not? But so th those examples, right? They don't. The, the machines don't understand what they're doing. They, just because it can, it, it doesn't have any real understanding beyond the paper towel dispenser in the bathroom. The one that can simulate human conversation and spit out text, or the one that can tell the difference between objects, or the one that can play Go. It's just numbers. It doesn't really understand, which is a frightening thing because. You know, one, one of the things that, that, that I think about this is, first, the level of AI today is not where people think it is as far as fear. Uh, the, the fear comes from an understanding of AI being way ahead of where it is today. So that's right there. Should, it's already, there's, there's time. Uh, and to, to build something that's truly intelligent, you need to understand intelligence. And we don't even understand intelligence. So the, the idea that we're going to build a truly general, it's called general AI, right? General intelligence. I think it, 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 we're, we're really far away from that. But the, the fear of smarter and smarter and smarter, I think I like to counter that with machines that are going to inherently make decisions that might affect the life or death of humans. And I don't mean machines, advanced machines. I mean a, a bear trap, an old cartoonish, like, you know, bear trap. That's a machine, and it can certainly kill someone if somebody steps there, right? Would you rather have a bear trap that has less intelligence, meaning you step, it snaps, or one that's more intelligent that says, wait a minute, this isn't a bear, or this is a person, or maybe I don't need to snap that hard, or maybe I shouldn't, you know? It, that's a safer machine. You make it more intelligent, it's actually going to be safer, right? The same thing with a landmine or, you know, any of these things that are making decisions. The more they, they, they know, the better. Now, uh, the same thing with a car, right? The car that's self-driving right now, making a decision of, do I turn left, do I turn right? It doesn't understand the value of human life. Yet, we're letting it choose if it's going to run somebody over or not. To me, that's frightening that it's not smarter. That is frightening, the fact that it's making life or death decisions, and it doesn't understand. It's just numbers, and it says turn left, turn right, because this algorithm says probability is better here. So a self-driving car is a little bit more uh, worrisome for you? Well, the, it, I guess it's a more concrete example, because it's a life or death situation that's more immediate, and people see that every day. And it doesn't, it doesn't understand. I, 
if it understood the value of human life and it had more intelligence behind it and understanding why, that would make me feel actually more comfortable because it would have some kind of sympathy. And then it goes into the conversation of, can we train machines to have empathy and sympathy, which would also make me feel more comfortable because if they can relate and understand human value, there's a lesser chance. You know, and the whole protection of ourselves and our future, I think that's probably a better way because trying to put rules and, and constrain the intelligence, if it truly becomes one day that intelligent, it will be so beyond our level of intelligence that we won't be able to outsmart it. So, Does it worry you that we, we could reach that point? Um, I think there we're is very a far away from that. But, but that's why I said, you know, it, we shouldn't be able to try to outsmart it because everybody's pushing to make it smarter than any human has ever been. So there's no way we're going to outsmart it. But if it gets, if it's brought up from a place of, can we think of how a machine would understand sympathy and, and empathy, then that's a little better because if it has those, then there's less of a chance of it needing, us needing to outsmart it because it has empathy and sympathy and, and it, it's basically growing up with, with that like a human would, right? Um, and when you have humans that have serious problems with, um, well, doing things that would put them in jail, you see that a lot of times they have less ability to have empathy and sympathy, right? Uh, so so maybe, that's what is missing. Let me find out, when did you first... Um get introduced to AI. How did you encounter AI? AI was an undergrad, probably my second or third year uh, as an undergrad. I took a course. Uh, I had algorithms and then AI and I think uh, probably three more courses as an undergrad. Um, but and you were hooked? Yes, I, I already knew of it. I hadn't approached it from a technical perspective. From a non-technical perspective, then yes, even you know, from movies and uh, since being little, the, the whole idea of the machines that are intelligent was very cool and, and interesting. Um, and you wanted to be a mad scientist? Mad scientist. That's still, what you told, still do. That, that hasn't changed since I was that five That you told your, gra your grandma. Right. This is growing up in Brazil. Yeah. Okay. So how did you come here to the U.S. then? For, for college, uh, when I finished high school in Brazil. Uh, you I, wanted to study here? Right, right. Why? Just... It's, a lot of the, the really great universities, and I think the leading research, I think, is the, the idea there. So you thought this was the place. Yeah. But then you came just a month before schools were going to open without any uh, seat or... Right. You, you were not registered in any school. Right. And you so, landed up in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> why the Midwest? Well, there was a great... People, you know, from Brazil, you <clears throat> go to New York. I'm just wondering why the Midwest, you know, the middle of snow. Yes, that's true. Um, we had, I wanted to be close to family. We had family in two or three places in the U.S. Uh, so, and I wanted to see which place had like, some great uh, university options, and that was one of them. Uh, so. so that's how we landed. Yes. So then you were also told, I, I, tell us how did you uh, then start studying? Because you just arrived a month before schools right. were to open. Right, so uh, I wanted to go to the University of Notre Dame. Um, they were already closed for applications. Uh, Holy Cross College is a community college. Uh, actually, they're full college now. Um, across the street from Notre Dame, fantastic place, great people. Uh, so I enrolled there, and I wanted to transfer into the engineering program at Notre Dame. And I was told, look, if you're coming from Holy Cross College into Notre Dame, it'll be easier if you transfer into Arts and Letters and then spend a year and then transfer internally in Notre Dame, which meant losing a year, and I, I really didn't want to do that. So I, I, I said, what do I need to do? And they said, well, you need to take the exact same curriculum uh, for the first two semesters before you transfer to Notre Dame. So I ended up, they have a partnership program with St. Mary's University, that's an all-girls school. Notre Dame, Holy Cross College, and Indiana University, South Bend. I ended up taking courses at four different universities in the same semester in order to get that. I was driving a lot. Uh, I can but, imagine. Yeah, so, but I can say in that first year, I attended a Catholic university, an all-girl university, a community college, and a uh, state university, the uh, IUSB. I attended all four of those <laughs> my first year. And you got your, uh, all your uh, grades, uh, the, the requirements. And I was able to transfer into the engineering program. So you, then you graduated from Notre Dame. Yes. And then you went and did your master's where? Indiana University. And then you went to Yale. Yes. Why Yale? I visited a lot. I, I think I visited the 11 different schools. So this time you visited all the schools you wanted to go oh, to. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So I visited, I think, 11 different schools uh, to make a decision. I, I liked the program. I liked the professor a lot. I thought that was the best opportunity for me to have a very unique type of PhD program for what I wanted. So 
What, yes. what was unique about the PhD program? Uh, I, uh, the uniqueness was more with the professor. Right. Uh, the program was fantastic, uh, and, and I like that. The professor, uh, just out, out of this world, how he runs things, uh, so much to learn besides the academic part uh, on the management side and understanding, because he has such a big lab. I mean, uh, he our best year in, in that lab, I think we, the, the professor published 42 pa 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 um, papers, uh, academic papers, uh, at, at top you know, publications, science and nature and genome research. Uh, 42 is... A lot. A lot. That's like a lifetime of a professor. And that was, you know, in a year. I think the other years he did 35, 33. I, that, I was attracted to that, to that uh, level of efficiency. And the, so it was two, two aspects. You there. like the intensity. The intensity. The intensity, the stress, the pressure I love. It pushes you to, to do more than what you otherwise would if you feel comfortable. And the also the ability to manage that, the ability to actually get work done at that rate and that level uh, was inspiring to me and I wanted to learn from him. And you were already married at this time? Yes, I got married uh, during my, uh, right before my master's, after undergrad, right at my master's. You were married and you're in a PhD program. This is in bioinformatics. Computational biology. Oh, computational biology. Okay. Pretty much. And then your wife says, let's have a kid. Yes. And you freak out. Yes, a little bit. We had talked about it. We were going to have babies and, and kids. And I, I, I loved that idea. I just didn't know when exactly. And she brought that up. Uh, we had been married for two years. I was in a PhD program. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a student. I'm not big, making a big salary. Uh, I, I have to finish my PhD. So the, the two big things in my head were one, Financially, I'm not ready. I'm not, you know, a provider yet. Um, and secondly, will I be able to finish my PhD? Will I be able to get all this work done? And I had this very long argument, all these reasons why not. And I think it took her about 30 seconds to a minute to, to, to change my mind. Uh, she said, look, it's always going to be hard having a kid. It'll never be easy. And there's always going to be something going on in our lives. We're never going to be, oh my goodness, there's nothing that I'm doing now. Let's have a kid. It's going to be your first job, then your first promotion, then your first house that you buy. It, it made perfect sense. I played in my head. I was like, yeah, uh, she's right. You know, I, these arguments I just use now, I'll be able to use in perpetuity till the day we die. So that's a flawed argument because then it's incompatible with the idea that I want to have kids. So I I was like, okay, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Let's so, let's do it. So you had a kid, and not only one, but now you have four kids. I have four kids, yes. And the fourth kid was born just before you were running out of your money. Well, yes. At the startup. I think yes. The, mm -hmm, yep. It was, it was stressful. The the yeah. Uh, Isla was born, I think, within two weeks of when the money was going to run out uh, when we started the company. Yeah. So you like to live on the edge. Yeah, I guess I guess that's not my edge, but for some people that's the edge. Yes. How does your wife handle that? Beautifully, spectacularly. She is wonderful. She does that's, not freak out. Well, everybody does. I think it's part of. Uh, <laughs> if I, I would be, I'd, if I wasn't freaking out, even I, I would be worried about my my sanity. But it's the right kind of freaking out, and then <laughs> working through it, you know, and thinking okay. through it. My final question is. Those who run startups, they usually have problems doing business calls at home. They end up sitting in the car and making calls. Have you done that? No, I've done it from home, but there will be two kids next to me and there will be you know, a kid in my arms and uh, it's intense sometimes. You, you don't go and sit in the car and do the calls? No, sometimes you know, uh, I'll, I'll find a room that's, that's empty, but a lot of times, inevitably, they'll find me. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be like, oh, daddy's here. Okay, and, oh, it's, I can manage. It's fine. Pedro, muito obrigado for doing this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for watching. If you missed any of our episodes, you can watch them on our website. And join me next week for another new conversation. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>